Welcome to EuroPCR 2023. My name is Sam Dawkins. I'm an interventional cardiologist from the UK. I'm delighted to be joined by Becky Hahn, who is the Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Columbia, and she is also a Professor of Medicine. Becky, wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. What we wanted to talk about today is some of the skill sets needed for aspiring uh, structural operators, and particularly in reference to, to mitral intervention. Uh, you're a, a very, very high volume interventional echocardiographer at Columbia. You must see many fellows coming through the system, many fellows in imaging and in intervention. My question to you is what, what is it when you see an interventional fellow that, that makes you see that they're going to they're gonna be good, they're going to do a good job? That's such a good question, Sam. I think the first thing is to really understand the three-dimensional anatomy of the heart. And if you understand that and, you know, the positioning of the probe and then also the position of the fluoroscopic machine and, and how, how you're imaging, then those fellows will be very successful. It's being able to marry together not just the imaging, but the three-dimensionality of the heart. And uh, understanding that and how the probe is moving and how your imaging, I think, is, is key. Sometimes before, we, we have a fellowship in structural imaging, and we'll use a simulator uh, to see if we can uh, figure out at that if if that person has not only the eye-hand coordination, mm -hmm. but the understanding of the three-dimensional anatomy. Mm -hmm. But I could throw that question back at you, because you also train a lot of fellows, and, and, and what do you see in, in the fellows when they come? Yeah, so I th it's, a, it's a really interesting question, and it's very, I mean, you'll, you'll see this as well, it's fascinating observing people when they come in and start doing structural procedures. Um, something I think Interventional trainees usually have started with coronary intervention, yeah. so they're very tuned into looking at fluoroscopy. And you, I can see when I'm standing next to the fellow out of the corner of my eye, I can see what they're looking at. Yeah. And usually they're looking at fluoro too much and echo not enough. And for the transeptal, for example, it's not a fluoroscopic procedure. You know, it's an, it's an echo procedure. So you look at fluoro for 5% and echo 95%. And there's quite an adjustment required because they, by reflex, look at the fluoro. So I think that that is really important. Um, and I think the other aspect that is really noticeable in fellows is fellows who have done, interventional fellows, that is, who've done transesophageal echocardiography before. And there's a real geographic variation in that, I think. In the, in the UK, uh, it's, it's quite uncommon for interventional fellows to have done transesophageal echo. What's the perspective in the US? To, in their general cardiology fellowship, do most cardiology fellows do transesophageal echocardiography? Yeah, I think most. Uh, it's obviously varies by the program. But I think uh, by the end of their fellowship, most of them have done um, at least some transesophageal echo. Uh, we have two advanced programs. One's for structural, one's just a regular advanced program. And those fellows obviously get a lot more training and can come into the, some of them will come into the procedures. Our fellows obviously are in the procedures all the time. Time. But I do think that that experience, even for the interventionalists, is really important. And so they, I think during their fellowship, really learn a lot more about imaging transesophageally than, than perhaps even uh, fluoroscopically, since, since they're so used to looking at the fluor fluoroscopy image. Um, but we have to go the other way also. So the, the echocardiographer now has to also know fluoro. And so in our lab, we have uh, fluoro screens in front of us so that we can really understand the relationship between the motion of the catheter on the fluoro screen and the motion that we see on the three-dimensional echo. And I think that's also really, really helpful. And it means that we're seeing the same thing. Um, therefore, I think perhaps communicating the same way. But uh, I, I do think that the language that we use uh, between the interventionalist and the, and the imager needs to be a common language. Yeah, so that was going to be my, my next question. Again, you see all, all of these fellows coming through. You obviously have a very close relationship with Sushil Kodali, and you work very closely together. And I'm guessing you can communicate with very little, uh, work, very few words. Yes. Because um, you've been working together for so long. But what do you think is important about that, that communication and interaction between the imager and the operator? That's, that's also such a good question. I think um, it's really key that obviously we speak the same language, but that we're communicating at the right time. And so um, I know when the fellows first come in and we're doing a transeptal, he'll say, okay, you've, you've, got, you've got the catheter up, but now you have to wait for the imager to find you and to find the catheter. And so it's that kind of patience um, that's exhibited by on both sides to uh, really allow that communication to happen. Um, but also, uh, again, 
to have that respect in the room. You know, we're, we're doing a job and, and helping hopefully guide the procedure um, as you are doing um, because you've got control of, uh, of your devices. And without that mutual respect and understanding of each other's uh, jobs and, 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 and positions within the procedure, I think uh, there's, it's hard to, to call that a team. Like you really need to have that teamwork. Well, I think I, I could not agree more. And the centers that are very good at it, it's an equal partnership. And I would say it's actually not an equal partnership. You're the, you're the one with the power um, because your, your job is, is more difficult than our job. And uh, for us to communicate properly and be respectful um, to each other is really important. And I think what I observe with teaching new sites is the transition, I'd be interested in your perspective on this, the transition between from diagnostic imager to interventional imager, because diagnostic imaging is a very different thing. You're, you're not an interventional decision maker during diagnostic imaging. You're also not following moving targets generally. You're yeah. going to standard views. Yes. You're, you're looking at standard structures and doing, running through a, a kind of checklist of, of views, aren't you? But moving from diagnostic imaging to interventional imaging, what, what would be your, your tips? Or, well, I think for both interventionalists and the imager, you have to really understand the procedure. So it's the anticipation of what's coming next so that you can actually move to the catheter because you know where it's going to go or you know what the next step is going to be. So you're preparing the image uh, in order for the interventionalist to be able to see it right away. And so every step of the procedure and then knowing your device. And so knowing every single device, its limitations and its strengths, um, I think is also one of the more important things we do. When we have a new device, we're all in servicing together and uh, you know, understanding the mechanics and all the motions of the device, I think are important for the imager as well as the interventionalist. And so uh, I, I do think uh, that helps a lot during the procedures when we know every single step, we know exactly what's happening. And that's also where the communication comes in. Yeah, and I think an another really important aspect is giving the imager the time that they need. There are aspects of the interventional side of it where we need time, but there are definitely aspects of the imaging side of it. You know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have a chance to have good guidance if we don't give you time to get the BICOM. You know, you need time to get the BICOM. We need to put the device in the right place so that you can see it and give you time to optimize that image so that we can then carry on and do the procedure. And sometimes you, you and particularly if the imaging is difficult, particularly in the tricuspid position, we have to get to our position and then wait and wait for the imaging to come. And that can take, that can take time. Often, often the imaging is challenging. Um, one of the other aspects I think that I've noticed in, in training new centers and watching centers who are very good at it is the importance of making the most of the fact that you have two brains in the room. It's much better when you do your grasp, for example. What my practice is and what I teach is that I do the grasp and when I've done the grasp, I then stop talking and I stand there and I think, if this isn't the perfect result, what am I gonna do differently? So I'm, I'm using that time to think, I might clock a little bit, I might go a millimeter more medial, I might do this, I might do that, I might optimize the posterior leaf, let's say. But I'm doing that in my head and allowing you as the imager to run through your workflow. So you're checking the gradient, you're looking at the pulmonary veins, you're looking at the color, but I'm not interacting with you at that point. I'm letting you uh, blind, essentially. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to influence what you say about the, the result. I'm, I'm letting you have the chance to do your assessment. And then I encourage the imagers who are often coming from a diagnostic background and less used to speaking out to then give me my school report and say, so I think this is this, I think the gradient is okay, I think the color is this. And I encourage the imager, imager to say, I think we should accept this, or I think we should not accept this and move it a bit medial or whatever it happens to be. And it, it makes such a difference because you're then making the most of the imager's expertise yeah. rather than the operator hectoring the imager into how severe the residual MR yeah, is. I, I, what, what's your perspective on no, that? I love that. I love that. I think that that's, uh, it's really key. You, you, you do have two brains in the room, so why not use them? And you, know, you don't want to influence each other too much. You want each to come to the same conclusion separately, and, and that's going to get you the best result. Um, and, and just as you say, giving the imager enough time. So for instance, we, we in particular like to use 
uh, multiplanar reconstruction, three-dimensional color in order to planimeter the orifices, the regurgitant orifices, and make a decision really based on our experience. Um, and there's a certain number cutoff that we say, oh, it's above that, we need another device. And so it becomes a more objective uh, decision-making process where you can both agree because we've already in advance agreed that this is where we're gonna stop. We make a plan, this is where we'll stop, this is where we're gonna keep going. And so um, I do think that planning ahead is pretty important as well. And then intraprocedurally understanding um, each perspective from the imager and the interventionalist and making sure that, that the communication there is clear. Yeah. Fantastic, well Becky, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you for taking the time and some really great tips there. Oh, thanks for having me.